Well, we get down to Montana. Uh, we just had a few signs there. The capital's Helena. Years and years ago, when I was still living in Idaho Falls, before I moved to Salt Lake, I uh, bought a company, a sign, small sign company, headquartered in Helena. Well, it proved to be a headache. It was a mistake. I think I might have told this story before. I don't know for sure. I decided that what I'd like to do is to uh, uh, make it uh, make it uh, profitable for one of my friends. While living in Idaho Falls, there was a man named John G. Macbeth, and John G. Macbeth was an insurance salesman for Beneficial Life, and I bought an insurance policy from him, a small one, but big for me in those days. And he then said to me, how well do you know accounting? I said, I've never had an accounting class in my life. I'm an artist, I can sell, I can paint, and I'm doing my best on the accounting side. He said, I'd like to teach you accounting. So I said, well, I'd like to learn from you. So he came to, and this is before I this is before I owned my first home. I just got married, actually. And so he'd come at five o'clock, and he would leave at eight o'clock, and we did that three days a week. And he explained to me what an asset was, <laughs> and he explained to me what a liability was, and how you put together a balance sheet, and uh, and a profit loss statement. He explained it all. And he really was a blessing to me. I said, now I gotta pay you. He said, no, no, I won't take any money. I wanna do this for you. I like you, Doug Snar. I think you've got a long ways to go in this life. And I'd just like to be part of your life. I wanna do this for you. So I got a hold of him and I said, uh, John G. How would you like to own a little tiny sign company up in Helena, Montana? He says, I'd love that. I said, well, now it's not, there's not much there, really. They don't have a lot going for it. But he and his wife and family went up. I gave it to him. And it didn't cost him a penny. And he stayed there the rest of his life. Got very involved in the church up there. He's able to send his kids to college. He lived a good life. He and his wife are both deceased now. You know, I felt good about that. I took and made a, turn, a mistake in buying in the first place into an asset for John G. Macbeth in gratitude for what he had done for me. I didn't ask him to teach me accounting. He volunteered that, knowing full well, I think by instinct, maybe a, a spirit told him, I don't know for sure, but I needed that help. Well, that was an easy state to, to solve, and uh, that worked out well. And John G., by the way, was up there and, and could drop over to the Capitol where the highway department was blah, blah, blah. And uh, so that one, was, that one was good. Now, Colorado, that went just like that. I had these two sign company owners over there. I just sailed right through. Now, Idaho was different. Idaho was a pain in the neck. And I believe they wanted to prove that Utah was not as smart as they thought they were. And that Jack Francis is not as smart as he thinks he is. And Doug Snar needs to be taken care of and cut down to size. 
So that stretched out for over three years with Idaho. Actually a pain in the neck for me. I don't want to go into details, except the council they had was really bad. The name was Tway, from Idaho Falls. Now, I heard by the grapevine, my dad used to say, that Tway, he's jealous of everybody. But he was a very bright attorney, but not honest. And uh, not at all honest. He reminded me of, he should be in Washington, D.C., where he'd fit like a glove. Now, I was able to get a hold of the governor, uh, Cecil Andrus. He liked me. Uh, he worked. We kept putting pressure on him. But he had to be careful. He was all for the environment. He gave a speech in Los Angeles, and he called me once, and he says, Doug Snar, would you write my speech for me? I liked you. I like to give it on the uh, highway beautification. You forgot more than anybody else in the country knows. Would you write it for me? I said I'll write it for you, and I did. He told me I never changed one word. He said. I read it once, and I knew you were spot on all the way through, and it made me feel good. Be able to get up, stand up there, and give a talk that makes sense, where it's a win-win, not just one-sided for the environment only. It's a win-win. Good. I like that. So he and I became friends, and uh, he's also deceased. It's amazing how many people that I know and that have helped me, they're all deceased practically, but Jack France is still alive. Thank heavens he is. I had one of the best conversations of my life with him last night. Finished at 1.30 in the morning. But, you know, they're four hours uh, behind us, so it wasn't 1.30 for him, not by any means. I see it was, that make it, what, 9.30, isn't it? 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, 12.30, 1.30, yeah, 9.30. When he wound up, it was 1.30 for me. Well... We came down to third, there are a total of 13 states. And I think the rest of the states, like Washington, Oregon, Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, then there was uh, Iowa uh, and uh, Nebraska. I believe that uh, they all fell in place. Uh, I didn't have any trouble. But Idaho drove me nuts. And uh, that stumbling block was uh, that attorney, Tway. And he would figure out this and this and this, by the law, this and this. Now, what I, helped me a lot was a guy named uh, Terry Crapo. Terry Crapo graduated from uh, high school in junior year, went to uh, Milo Falls, went to... Uh, BYU, he graduated in two years. Then he went on to Harvard and graduated number one in his class in law. And, but he married an Idaho Falls girl. He became a state president. He was just as bright, young attorney as there was, and he became the Speaker of the House while he was still in his 20s in the Idaho legislature, and he helped me. Now, he worked for my uncle, William S. Holden, who I've been told by many is the most brilliant attorney in Idaho's history, and I can't judge that. All I know is that he's just the most amazing uncle I had, and my favorite uncle. He was not LDS, by the way. He married my mother's oldest sister, but uh, he was good. And I think that since he was born in Missouri, <laughs> that might have some bearing on it. But I gave him a real working over a number of times. 
But as he was dying, he told me, and he'd been all over, that you are the most remarkable entrepreneur that I've ever met. Really humbled me to the earth to hear him say that. I give you an idea of his stature. When Henry Ford II divorced his wife, we're talking a lot of money now. He came to Idaho Falls, hired Bill Holden to represent him because he was a consummate negotiator. He believed, talk, 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 till you finally get your way, but don't break your pick in the process. I'll never forget that. Don't break your pick in the process. And then work it and just let it work out. And always keep it on a very friendly basis, but don't break your pick. I have a picture of him downstairs on the door that goes into my uh, den. It's as wide as the door, blown up. And I just think, well, he was a very, very handsome man, by the way. But uh, don't break your pick, Doug. I have the tendency to break my pick because I get all upset. And because uh, I'm high strung, <laughs> and he's, he's smooth. It's just so smooth and so pleasant. I once said I'd like to take it to England to my home bell. He never had time. But his wife Ida went with me, took her over. And uh, I loved Ida. And for her to be in a home that was built uh, 72 years before Columbus discovered America, uh, it was quite an experience for her on three levels. Took the train, went on into London, took her to a couple plays. I mean, it just she just loved it. Never been uh, to Europe before. Uh, he never had time to go. Uh, but uh, it was good. That's quite something, though, you know, to have Henry Ford II come to you <laughs> from Idaho Falls. But that's how a consummate of a of a man he was. I'm thinking of a little poem that I've quoted to myself over and over and over again in all the years that I was negotiating with the government. Basically, all I did was negotiate. When I analyzed, well, what did you actually do, Doug? If you could just use one word, all these years, working with state governments, the federal government, and various agencies. Now, I have a book right there of David Kennedy. David Kennedy was a banker. He was the president of Continental Bank in Chicago. He's LDS. And he was chosen uh, by uh, Nixon to be his secretary of the uh, 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 Treasury. And I'll never forget that in order to get the bill through that I wanted to get through, we had to have the Treasury Department to look at it. The reason is because uh, the idea was to take money out of the Highway Trust Fund, and therefore they'd have to sign off on that. So I go over there, knock on the door. It wasn't quite that simple by any means. <laughs> I had to get that appointment. That was not all that easy. But I got the appointment. And I remember him sitting there. And I'll never, I'll never forget this, just like it was yesterday. And he was sitting in his chair, and uh, he had his lower button on his white shirt was unbuttoned, and the one above it, those two buttons. And the tie was off to the side. And he sat there and he said, I never dreamed that this job would be so exhausting and so hard for me to do. And I just, for some reason, just hit me. It is hard, and it does take a lot of work, a lot of work. Well, when that ended, 
He moved to Salt Lake City and did a lot of work as an ambassador for the church to go certain places, meet certain people, all kinds of things like that, because he had the reputation, particularly having served as the Secretary of Treasury in uh, the United States government. And uh, I just mentioned that little story to you as a, just to let you know how difficult it was. But one thing that I've always quoted over and over again, it's just very, very simple. If you knew me and I knew you and both of us could clearly see with an inner sight divine the meaning of your heart and mine, I'm sure that we would differ less and clasp our hands in friendliness. Our thoughts would pleasantly agree if I knew you and you knew me. And as I look back, I think that the key attitude on my part, and it had to be developed, uh, had to be that I've got to get to know them first. So it never hurts yourself to ask one basic question. And that question was this. What would you do if you were me? I think I've asked that question in my adult life as a businessman in many different contexts more than any other single question. What would you do if you were me? And I've observed that in most people, a change took place, some much more so than others. But you could see the attitudinal change in their face and in their eyes. And sometimes it was just instant. Because it let them know that I was a human being. It let them know that I trusted them enough to ask the question. And I was waiting an answer from them. And so I think in many cases, if not, if not most, it brought out the best in them in the context of that conversation. And generally, in my case, I needed them. They didn't need me. I needed them. And therefore, I was putting myself in a position that was inferior, inferior to their position or hence I would never have asked the question.